Hello and welcome to our talk explaining a star logic process. My name is Jörg Kassens and I'm honored to be able to present this joint work with Rebecca Wegener, Lawrence Habenicht and Julian Blom. So explaining a star logic process. So when we talk about dialogues, we don't only mean a dialogue between humans, but we also mean a dialogue uh, of a human with a machine. And when we talk about explaining, we don't only mean an explanation given by a human, but also an explanation given by a machine. So in essence, we're talking about explainable artificial intelligence or XAI. So why would we need machines that are able to explain themselves? Well, one reason might be that you want to give a user the right to an explanation um, if the user is being um, uh, the object of an algorithmic decision. Um, but in our opinion, legal requirements can only be a motivating force. Uh, but uh, the main reason here is um, or the key reasons are that uh, we think that human-centered artificial intelligence is in need of explanations. Explanation is such a central concept to human to human communication that we think it should also be present in uh, human-centered artificial intelligence in order to be truly human-centered. So let's talk about this concept of human-centered AI a bit more. Uh, let's maybe make a wish list. What kind of characteristics would we like our AI to exhibit? Uh, first of all, we would like it to be personalized. So being able to respond to different users' needs and requirements and uh, recognize these different users as well. Uh, then we would like it to be anticipatory, meaning that it does not only react uh, on explicit interaction, but also implicit interaction, so that uh, no conscious mediation is possibly necessary for the AI to, to act on the user's behalf. And uh, finally, we would like it to be adaptive so that it can change, uh, uh, react to, to changing user needs over time and uh, changing user requirements over time. So these three aspects uh, are what uh, Boris Rita and Emil Arts call uh, system intelligence uh, and, and together they make uh, up one part of what they consider core facets of ambient intelligence systems together with uh, embeddedness so that you basically have devices uh, surrounding you which weave themselves into the fabric of everyday life uh, to quote Weiser uh, and that they are context aware contextualized as we would say um, so these devices can the systems can recognize the uh, situational context you uh, you are in. So these three aspects, the system intelligence together with the contextualization and the embeddedness make, uh, in our opinion, also a good starting point when we start discussing what uh, human-centered AI should be all about. Arts and, and Derita also uh, uh, considered going further and then they, they uh, replaced, so to say, uh, in, a, in a further step, um, the, the system intelligence by social intelligence. So that's basically the, the, the second part of the um, of the headers you saw. So we want the, want the system also to be socialized, compliant to social convention, being empathic, so taking uh, user emotions into account and being conscious about their conscious about their, their inner, inner state as well. So that's uh, basically um, a step further on. Uh, but but we will focus on on the first uh, part for now the the system intelligence. Okay, so next preliminary, uh, we consider machines as potential meaners in a semiotic system. What do we uh, mean by that? Um, now, if we have a human to human communication, we would usually um, not hesitate to say, okay, this is the, the communication between these two humans is a, a semiotic process, so where different meaners engage with each other. Um, and when we have a, a machine as a mediator, like in computer-mediated communication, um, then we would probably also say it's still a semiotic process, human to human. Uh, but what happens now if we remove the, the, the human? Now, in our opinion, if the, the machine still acts as if uh, it was uh, in, the, in the previous uh, uh, situation, so if the, the behavior is basically the same, uh, for all intents and purposes, and then uh, uh, when it acts as a mediator, then we consider this uh, itself as, as a MENA. So in our opinion, 
uh, machines, uh, artificial intelligences can be part of a simulatic process. Um, uh, and in fact, it, it gets really interesting if we have uh, uh, several actors, so the, the machine and several humans uh, are part of the same semiotic process. So um, the machine is, is both a meaner in this process and a mediator. Now the third preliminary is um, um, just a very, very and, and grossly simplified view of uh, explanation as it has been uh, researched before in, in, the, in the realm of um, AI and AI related fields. Um, um, and, uh, and other fields which uh, contributed to the discussions in, in the field of artificial intelligence and human-computer interaction. So uh, a modern approaches of or modern yeah a modern approaches to explanations say that they are crucial to understanding cognition, reasoning, discovery, learning, and uh, developing a sense of self, as Tanya Lombroso uh, uh, puts it. For for example, she she says that explanations are the foundation of our social interaction. And um, uh, explanations at the same time are contextualized. So not only the type of explanation that is used, but also how the explanations are evaluated is, is highly uh, contextualized. Um, and, and the problem which uh, we often see when we take these um, uh, notions of explanations in AI, then that we, we very often see that it's reduced to a, a product view. Uh, so, as Edwards et al. Uh, put, put it, uh, the accounts of explanation typically define explanation as a product rather than explaining the process. And, and we are uh, very much in favor of, of looking at the, the explanatory process, at least as well. Um, other aspects which are important for the genesis of, of our notion of explanation uh, in human-centered AI, uh, we can find uh, in constructive empiricism uh, von uh, Frasen's uh, early claims that explanations are always an answer to an implicit or explicit contrastive why question that in particular the contrastive part is, is very en vogue again in, in um, at least parts of the uh, explanation-aware um, AI uh, community so that an explanation should be able to to ask the question of why is a certain state preferred to, to another state. Uh, but we think that uh, an important contribution is here um, that um, the, the context in which a question is asked or an explanation is given um, implicitly contains information about which answer the receiver would prefer. And, and that's an aspect we also take up in our own notion of explanations. Uh, another as, uh, another as line of thought we find in pragmatism and in Achenstein's uh, work that a request for explanation is a request for understanding of something, which, which seems obvious in, in, on one hand. Um, but but uh, he, on the one hand, he uh, opened up for, for different kind of questions to be asked for, not only why questions, but also what, where, how questions, and, and so on. The the aspect which we find very really interesting here is that only information that is not obvious should be communicated. So um, if I can, can um, uh, reasonably expect the user to have a, a certain understanding already, then I should not add that to my explanation. Um, uh, from the cognitive sciences, we, we have uh, early accounts again, by, for example, by, by Roger Shank, who not only proposed a case-based approach to explanation, uh, so based on explanation patterns, um, but um, he also made a, made a point about that explanations are required first and foremost in anomalous situations where uh, the internalized model, the, the mental model of the world is, is not met. So. Uh, an explanation should address surprising aspects um, um, of, of the world. Um, you don't want an explanation for something which, which is, uh, you already, uh, doesn't surprise you, so to say. And um, now it would be, you could, on, on the one hand, you could consider explanations as a very vast and, and, and com, com, uh, complicated uh, issue. So we need to have some kind of operational view and um, interesting here is, is, for example, the work by, by David Leake, that explanations are assumed to have uh, uh, roles. Uh, they play uh, support 
of a claim or arguments uh, against it. And um, now one problem we have here is that uh, large parts of artificial intelligence still see explanations as monologic. So the, the system uh, uh, provides a certain explanation, but uh, we cannot consider it from, from only the system's perspective because uh, both explainer and explainee have an agenda and uh, it makes a difference whether an explanation is asked for or offered, for example. So uh, we think that this uh, monologic view of explanation is not sufficient. And um, last but not least, for, for our understanding of, of um, explanations, we, we look at semiotics. And, and Halliday says that uh, human communication is inherently multimodal. And, and that's very strong. So language itself is not monomodal. Uh, and other modalities are not there only to help language along uh, and they do not only provide context for the language but they are part of the, the whole semiotic process. Now this existing body of research and explanations has uh, informed our own model of explanations which is basically uh, explanations as a functional variety of language behavior uh, which exhibits certain characteristics like being contextualized which itself is uh, con being comprised of being context aware, knowing which situations uh, we are in, and context sensitive, uh, acting according to the situation we, we assume we are in. It's construed by user interest, and, and here in particular, the uh, addressing the surprise part. Um, it's uh, multimodal um, and it's dialogic. And it's these last two uh, aspects multimodality and dialogic, we are going to focus. Uh, for the rest of the talk, um, and we will be looking at a couple of uh, experiments we've been we've been doing. In the first one, we used an off-the-shelf voice assistant as a stand-in for an artificially intelligent explainer, and participants were asked to to get explanations on five different subject areas, uh, both from this voice assistant and from a human explainer. So uh, one part of the experiment was that they were uh, located at the uh, the uh, um, voice assistant and could ask any question uh, they, they wanted in order to get explanations on the subject area. Uh, in the second uh, setting, they would talk to a, a human explainer, uh, again asking any questions they, they wanted. Um, and uh, we would we, we did videos of, of both uh, situations and of course we, we switched around who of the test participants and counted which uh, situation first. Um, afterwards, they were uh, asked to explain the concepts they just learned to another human being um, and they were asked to uh, fill out a, a questionnaire uh, on their ex uh, um, experiences. So this is uh, the, the questionnaire, this is uh, the situation where they became the explainers. Again, uh, videos for further analysis. And um, in the end, they got a bit of uh, food because you always have to treat your test subjects uh, nicely. Um, now, some preliminary findings we have, uh, not surprising, basically, and not, 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 nothing of this is really surprising. It's just uh, nice to, to see it in, in, this, in this study. Um, uh, human explanations made extensive use of gestures, multimodality, as uh, there was an extensive use of back channel communication. Again, multimodality, uh, gestures, eye contact, uh, affirmation, uh, etc. Um, then uh, there was a dynamic uh, adjustment to the level of understanding, in particular, uh, of course, with the, with the human e explainer. So starting off from basic explanation and adjusting uh, depending on, on the feedback from the, from the human uh, uh, explainee, um, um, adjusting the, the level of details, for example. Uh, and, and two very interesting things uh, we think is one that uh, it was clearly use of uh, colloquial language to connect with known concepts, so contextualization of the explanation given. And um, what was really nice to see in a way is that the uh, explainees drew from both explainers, so both the machine and the human, when becoming the explainers. So it's not that that um, the the explanations given by the machine uh, were discounted uh, upfront because they were not multimodal or. or because they were coming from a machine, so that, that's a that's a nice uh, uh, um, a nice finding because it, it supports that we can actually make machines uh, explainers. Um, so the second part involved uh, uh, a Udo. So here we went from a, uh, from a purely cognitive learning situation to something which uh, involved learning a movement. Uh, uh, 
uh, sequence. We used this this Udo situation because um, the fact that understanding and learning has actually taken place is demonstrated by a successful uh, action uh, afterwards. So so if the test participants could do the the Udo move, then that uh, learning uh, was successful. Then the explanation worked. Um, um, it's it's already very common in, in uh, this kind of training that you use different explanation strategies. So you have verbal explanations, you have uh, demonstrations, uh, you have uh, questions and clarification parts, and, and you have uh, obviously the practice phase with individual help. Um, now, our explanation was given in, in a pseudo-computerized form in, in the form of a, uh, the training material was basically a computer presentation. Uh, so we had two starting videos showing the, the move uh, from two different perspectives. Um, and um, that from then on, the, 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 we uh, went into the dialogue part where basically the, the uh, uh, test subject could either ask for more information uh, or, or move forward. Um, so uh, the other parts were textual description and uh, both pictures and uh, uh, additional videos which which showed different uh, aspects uh, in, in detail and and afterwards uh, uh, test subjects were uh, asked to actually perform the uh, activity together uh, with the teacher so um, actually these uh, these videos we, we used uh, live action videos and, and and photos so this comic version is, is just to protect the privacy of the uh, participants uh, of the trainer so what are the preliminary findings here? So we, we divide this into the three different phases. Um, first, be before we get to the, to the activity where the uh, test subjects actually show how and what they learned. Before, before we get to that part, there are very different strategies of the individuals uh, interacting with the, with the material. Uh, some went into very detailed, uh, um, wanted to watch every video and so on, and, and some wanted to go uh, move forward to the practical part very very quickly um, and that's uh, very nice because it means that we can actually uh, use different communication strategies up front for our explanation so if we if we again uh, personalization uh, identify our users and then um, there are if there is an uns there's also the part that um, uh, the activity was just unsuccessful and that's I basically in a, in a way the easy ones where the explanation failed uh, maybe the the trainee didn't have the necessary motor skills or there was mismatches and errors in the material uh, and so on so that was uh, we knew the explanation failed but it was kind of easy to to, to see what happened there and but we think the most interesting parts are uh, when there are breakdowns during the um, the actual uh, practice part um, these, these breakdowns can either be caused by changes in context, it doesn't matter how controlled the environment is, if some siren goes off in the distance and that, that uh, disturbs the situation or the teacher made a mistake. But, but the really interesting part are, are when, the, uh, when there was clearly a, um, uh, a need for more explanation on the part of the trainee, and this could also be made uh, clear, made, made uh, and the trainee could also ask for this uh, this uh, explanation either explicitly uh, uh, asking for explanations through case, but also on, on, uh, uh, just implicitly by changing uh, the behavior. And that's a very interesting aspect, which also ties in with some other research we would uh, we are doing uh, on, on uh, behavioral markers for for meaning. Okay, so. What does it all uh, mean? So surprise, surprise, explanatory processes are multimodal and dialogic. Uh, this is small studies actually support our, our view of what explanation should be like. Um, very nice for us. People are prepared to take and use explanations from machines. Um, and also very nice. Uh, it, it seems possible to predict when people might need explanations uh, during the act, like multimodal um, markers for for insecurity, for need for explanation. Uh, so what are we going to work on in, in the future? We are using these experiments to explore, further explore the uh, dialogic, multimodal and contextual nature of explanations. Even if the, the number of participants is limited, there's a lot of video material which we still go through, uh, annotate uh, specific aspects of the communication. Um, we are working further on a, on a clear theoretical framework, basically 
um, yeah, um, honing in on the on the theoretical backgrounds of this explanatory uh, uh, series. Um, we want to, of course, uh, me being a computer scientist, we I want to have this. Uh, um, um, having some results at the end, we want some artifacts. So we want to integrate it with existing human-centered design methods, design uh, processes. Um, and as part of this, we are also uh, building an evaluative framework because uh, we need to know whether an explanation was actually successful or not. And uh, we are both focusing on the explanation as a product and the explaining as a process to see whether the product was good enough or whether the process was successful. Uh, and of course, um, we, we very much focus on these this human to, uh, experiments for now, but in the end, we, we need to make this computational operational test and actual AI systems from the ground up. Uh, okay, uh, thanks so much for your attention. Again, uh, collaborative work with Rebecca, Lawrence, and, and Julian, and, and uh, happy uh, to get to your questions. Thank you. <laughs>